What is up, everybody? Welcome into the first edition, the inaugural show, the pilot episode of All Say This with Chris Castellani. I am your host, Chris Castellani. Thank you very much for tuning in today. Before we get into the meat of what I want to talk about regarding the world of sports, I want to give a little rundown of what the heck the show is actually going to be about. Because really, all I've done up to this point is post the graphic, which I posted on Twitter last week. And to start off, thank you. Thank you for the incredible support and the kindness that you all showed me when I posted that. I mean, you know, Twitter giveth and Twitter taketh away. It can be a very ugly place. But the way that people responded uh, positively when I said that I'm going to be doing this show on my YouTube page, uh, it's awesome. Very, very, very awesome. And I appreciate all of you. Now, my amazing producer, Matt Hankel, who makes me look way better than I should uh, in my movie reviews all the time and hopefully going forward on this show as well, made that awesome graphic and it had the Tigers font and I, I wanted it to have the Tigers font, but this is not going to be a Tigers show. Don't get me wrong. We're going to be doing a flash dance and we're going to pull that lever and we're going to shower ourselves in Tigers content this summer. I can promise you that, but this is going to be all encompassing. On this show, Chris Castellani will talk about whatever Chris Castellani wants to talk about. It will have a main focus on Michigan-based sports, whether it be Michigan, Michigan State, Tigers, Lions, Pistons, Red Wings, whatever. There will be those shows, though, where there's going to be an issue in the world, whether it be the world of sports or just the world period, in which I'm going to talk about stuff that I just want to talk about. It's kind of like those sitcoms, right? They have the very special episode. We're going to have some of those very special episodes. There's going to be a few things I'm going to try to refrain from. I don't have much interest in talking about politics on here. I think it's a losing battle. I think you isolate your audience. By doing that, I don't foresee myself doing that again unless there's some extraordinary circumstance where I got to bring something up. But for the most part, this will be a sports show. The movie-related stuff will uh, stick here on this YouTube page where I'm going to be doing the individual reviews and obviously on Lights, Camera, Barstool where I'm, I'm, I'm co-hosting with Jeff and Ken Jack right now. But this, is, this will be primarily a sports show. Two days a week, we're going to do Mondays and Fridays. A Monday recapping the weekend, Fridays recapping the week. And uh, I really am looking forward to bringing this all to you. And this show is going to change. It's going to grow. It's going to evolve. Backgrounds will change. Locations will change. Microphones will change. Lighting will change. Um, and I, 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 I can't wait to see how it evolves. You know, I, I am fortunate enough to be in a situation at a company with a boss who is hell-bent on just having me create content. Whether that content's good or bad, they just want me creating and uh, they have said that if you want to do a show, if you want to create content, create content. Go ahead and do it. Have at it. Do your thing. And if it's good, we'll promote it. Well, I, I intend on having everything I put out be good because I am a talker. My blogs are fine. They're serviceable. I think they're good for the most part, but I'm a better talker than I am a writer, and uh, I can't wait to see how this thing evolves. It will grow primarily based off of uh, how, how you respond to it. And I, I hope that all of you, if you enjoy this product, will spread the word, like, subscribe, tweet about it. Um, can't wait. Can't wait. So let's jump in now. Enough of these soliloquies. Though I guess technically the show is kind of just one big soliloquy. It's 30 minutes of me monologuing. Beside the point, let's jump into the main story today, and that is March. March Madness College Basketball is in full swing. The conference tournaments are over. The field of 68 has officially been announced, and we'll start with my Michigan Wolverines here who snuck into the tournament as an 11 seed. They will be playing in one of my favorite cities in America, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, in fairness, I'm not really much of a world traveler, but hey, it's semantics. I love Indy. It was, it was a wonderful place to be when Michigan won the Big Ten Championship in football. Last December, a great time. They will be going up against the six-seeded Colorado State Rams. I don't know a whole lot about Colorado State. I looked at their roster. Uh, Michigan will have a size advantage, and I think Michigan will have more talent. I don't. I can't recall a team in my fandom existence that I think is more difficult to predict than this uh, Michigan basketball team. They, I think they could beat Colorado State easily, and they could lose easily. This is a team that lost to UCF. In December, there's no if ands or buts. I mean, that nobody knows hey, what's that Wolf of Wall Street line. Nobody knows if it's going to go up or down or side to side. I don't know this team. I guess the question I'll pose to myself and the question I'll pose to the audience is: Is there any reason to be optimistic about this March for Michigan? Well, let's break it down one step further. Let's define optimistic. By optimistic, do I mean this is a team that can make a run into the second or oh my god, even third weekend? 
To me, no. They're just too darn inconsistent. They haven't won back-to-back -back games in a month. Well, guess what? To make it to the second weekend, you got to win back-to-back -back games. So that right away, that gives me you know a reason to be like, I, I just I don't see it happening. They open as a three-point favorite against Colorado State. One of the reasons why I think Michigan fans could be relatively optimistic, at least about the first weekend, is the fact that this draw, for as miserable as the season has been at points, as inconsistent and as crazy as it's been, it's a pretty good draw. They open in Indy relatively close to home against a Colorado State team that is quite good. You know, I mean, that they what, got five losses on the season. Absolutely no slouch, but there's no slouch in the tournament anywhere. These are the 68 best teams in the country. No slouch, but, you know, when I think of six seeds, you know, I've seen some really good programs and some really good teams capable of going to the Final Four uh, be on the sixth line. I don't think that's the case with this Colorado State team. And it gives me reason to believe, okay, maybe Michigan can win that game. Now, if they win that game, they would likely, you never know what can happen in March, play a Tennessee team that I've, I watched a fair amount over the weekend and I think is really good. I think Rick Barnes is one of the most underrated coaches in the country. All, all he does is coach at football schools and win all the time. He won a heck of a lot at Texas, took him to a Final Four in 2003 with TJ Ford. And he's he just won a conference uh, tournament championship. Uh, in the SEC with Tennessee. So that would be a tough matchup. I think that despite all the nonsense that's gone on this year, uh, this this has worked out relatively well for this Michigan team. But is this 13, 14, 18 where I look at a, a Michigan team and I go, man, they can make, they can go second weekend, they can go third weekend? Absolutely not. Th this season has been a mess. Look, if they make it to the second weekend and do something crazy, it makes up for a whole lot of it. But... This version of Michigan basketball has gone sideways so often, and they were preseason top five. And while I and I'll, I'll, you know, hand to God, I fell into the hype. I was under the belief this team was going to take what they did last year. They were going to take off, and they were going to be every bit as good, if not better. And we're going to and by this time, you know, we were going to be talking about a team that's on the one line or the two line that's winning conference championships and potentially going to the final four. I was wrong. I was really, really wrong. A lot of people were really, really wrong. I don't think that there's a sport in the world where teams suffer more from overhype than they do in college basketball because you just you never know what the freshman. And I think that I grossly undervalued the talents of certain guys that Michigan lost. You know, Franz Wagner Probably was not the the tip the college basketball player that a lot of people thought he could be. Franz Wagner was one of the best players in the country. He was gone. I was naive to believe that somebody like Caleb Houston was going to step in uh, and take over uh, for him, and it's put Michigan in a tough spot. But it's that's what's weird about the tournament, man. You wipe that slate clean the second March comes, and after a few weeks, you could be talking about a great disappointment uh, to a team that grossly overachieved and ended up making a deep run. I don't see it happening with with this unit, though. I think that Indiana game was a microcosm of what their entire season has been, and I haven't even recapped that yet. Michigan had a 17-point lead uh, in Indy against Indiana, an Indiana team that got into the tournament by winning that game. I mean, Indiana's in a playing game. They're on the 12 line you know, right now. So, I mean, Michigan uh, was about to knock them out of the tournament, and they completely fell apart in the second half. Through 30 minutes— it was another one of those moments, and we've had a lot of them with this Michigan team this year where I went, whoa, is the are they now turning the corner? I, I felt that way after the Purdue game. I felt that way after uh, the first Indiana game when they went to Assembly Hall and dominated. And every time I feel like here's the moment where we're finally going to see the Michigan team that people predicted we'd see, they fall apart. And I think at some point this weekend in Indy, they'll have another moment where they hit the wall, whether it's against Colorado State or Tennessee or somebody else. I feel like it's inevitable that the team we've seen through the first 30 games is going to, or the first 31, I'm sorry, is going to be the team that we're going to see um, in, in this tournament. I love Michigan basketball. I was talking, I was hanging out with my buddy Drew uh, at uh, Arts Pub in, uh, is it East Lansing? Lansing, East Lansing. And I said to him, like, man, there's something about March I just love. You check out the bracket, you go, hey, man, if we win this, if we win this game, then we can win that game. And if we can, if we win that game, Hell, we're in the Elite Eight. If we go to the Elite Eight, we can go to the Final Four. I love March. I love when Michigan makes deep runs in March. Nothing would please me more than to see this Michigan team have this insane, out-of-nowhere run like UCLA had last year as an 11 seed. I just I just don't see it. They're too inconsistent. They don't really do 
Here, here's the, the big thing in March, is that I think to win a national championship, you have to do almost everything relatively right. There are exceptions. You know, UConn in 2014. There are those weird you know, anomalies where a, a lower-seeded team wins it all. But for the most part, the team that ends up winning the whole thing, like Baylor last year, is typically a team that's got some dogs. But to make the Final Four, usually you have to do something right. Last year, UCLA as an 11 seed made it and you know broke my heart when they played Michigan in the Elite Eight. But Mick Cronin teams are very tough, and they're physical, and they play good defense. And I think people probably overlooked their physicality. And they, they got to the uh, tournament, and they went nuts, and they made it to the national championship. I would love to find a, a, a quality of this Michigan team that makes me say, okay, that's a quality that can get them uh, to the second weekend. I don't see it. Weirder things have happened. Rooting for them. Hope they find it. Hope it works out. But a different team than what we've seen through 31 games is going to be what we're going to have to see in the tournament because the team we've seen up to this point is not a team that's going to make it past the second round, arguably not even past the first, depending on what Colorado State team shows up. Moving right along, we're talking about Michigan State now. Michigan State had a very good showing. Over the weekend, they won two games, nearly blew one against Maryland uh, when Maryland put the press on uh, late in that game. But then they go on to beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten quarterfinals. And they, they played Purdue really tough in the semifinals on Saturday. A.J. Hogard was great. Tyson Walker has an ankle injury. No real word about uh, when he's going to be returning. But they have they have an interesting draw. They have a very interesting draw. This is not one of the more talented Izzo teams. It's not, but it's a seven seed. They were a seven seed when they made it to the Final Four in 2015. I think that when you look at this draw, I'll I'll, I'll say this. <laughs> Roll credits. They're playing Davidson in the first game. Davidson, you cannot convince me that this wasn't intentional. That they looked at it and went, oh, well, you know, it's just, it's only fitting that these two teams got to play. No, like... Foster Lawyer, there's the built-in storyline there. Foster Lawyer, probably maybe the most hated Michigan State basketball player of my lifetime. I mean, people just could not stand him. Really huge recruit. Backed up Cassius Winston for two years. Never gave him much. Then came in, uh, supposed to be the starting point guard last season. Gave, gave him even less. Transfers to Davidson. Has a wonderful year at Davidson. Had an awful, awful game in the conference championship against Richmond on Sunday. But he's the team's leading scorer. He shot the ball well. Now going back to his uh, his former school, like it's an interesting matchup, and I I do think it'll be a close game, but I think that much of the much of the hype surrounding this matchup has more to do with the drama than it does the matchup. I think Michigan State wins this game. Now, if Tyson Walker doesn't play, if that ankle doesn't hold up, then we're looking at something different. But I think that Michigan State in the Big Ten tournament against both Wisconsin and Maryland found something that hasn't necessarily been there for them all year, really the last two years, which is they were substantially more physical uh, than they'd been all season. And that's that's why Izzo has been so successful in March is the fact that, yeah, that look, they've had great guard play and they've had good shooters and they've been tough, but they've won those 60 to 55 games in March. And over the last several years, really the last two, uh, 2020, that, that team was really good. Obviously everything got canceled, but over the last two years, you've never felt like this was a team that physically, when the going gets tough, is capable of grinding out a, a win in, in the tournament. I think this team is capable of doing that if, one, Marcus Bingham gets the minutes he deserves, and two, he plays like he did against Wisconsin. Now that's a tall order. He The game he played against Wisconsin on Saturday was the best game of his career. I believe that was 19 points for him. I, I want to say it was a career high. He was physical. He got a ton of boards. I think they are good enough to get by Davidson because Davidson is a team with a lot of scores. But one thing that's gone overlooked, maybe not overlooked, but I don't think people have talked about enough with this Michigan State team is the fact that they are a pretty darn good three-point shooting team. I think that Davidson is simply going to try to outscore Michigan State at the perimeter. But I think Michigan State is every bit as capable of of responding with a body blow of their own. I think they beat Davidson. I do think they move on to the next round. Now, if they don't, hypothetically, if they do not win this game and Foster Lawyer goes off, we will be talking about one of the great revenge games in the history of the NCAA tournament. I, I, I know a lot of people act like they like him now. Foster Lawyer got put through the ringer when he was at Michigan State. And don't get me wrong, he wasn't any good. Like, he was he was really, really bad and not fit. But in general, though, I think most of the faults, and I love Tom Izzo, but most of the faults of Foster Lawyer's time at Michigan State uh, fell on the coaching. 
It was very apparent early. I mean, early in his freshman year. This is not a Big Ten player. And they kept playing him, and by his junior year, he was starting, and everyone was begging, put Hogard in, put somebody else in. And finally, they poached the transfer portal this year, and they brought in Tyson Walker. And then that, that is, you know, I'm, I'm all over the place here, but that is another thing that does give me some optimism about Michigan State going forward is the fact that I really think they figured out the point guard play because they have two good point guards. Tyson Walker has been, has he been like this amazing player? Has he been Kenneth Walker, right, in the transfer portal in terms of those pickups? No, but he's been pretty darn good. And, and over the last several weeks, he's become the alpha, the assassin, the late-game scorer that they that every team needs in March. And when he went down on Saturday, I think there were a lot of people who felt like Purdue was about to run away with that game. A.J. Hogard was brilliant. Now, for, what, for some reason, and not to take anything away from Hogard, but for some reason, Purdue is just terrible at stopping uh, penetration. That they they let guys get in the lane all the time, and Hogard was playing. I, I can't remember who tweeted this. It might have been Chris Solari, maybe Charbonneau. I'm not sure. Said that that was like a Cassius Winston caliber effort, just the way that he was getting into the lane, distributing, slashing, brilliant outing. AJ Hogard is going to be a wonderful, wonderful player at Michigan State. He's only in his sophomore season, and, and that's why I don't. Let's say Michigan State doesn't make it past Davidson, or let's say they don't make it past the first weekend. I'm still under the belief that this year's Michigan State team took steps forward. People forget like how pretty bad they were in 2021. I mean, they still had by all accounts or a, a, a season that most programs would want to have, but they were, they were very underwhelming. I believe that this year's Michigan state team is a teaser trailer for what I believe will be a really good team next year. Now we've seen that in the past though. I remember thinking in 2015 that that was a teaser trailer for a team that was going to be really good the next season. And while it was, that 2016 team with uh, Denzel Valentine uh, ended up winning the uh, conference tournament. They, uh, they didn't make it past the first round, and that 2015 team made it to the Final Four. Izzo has gone to Final Fours with teams that you looked at and went, I mean, I just don't know. I don't think he's ever gone to a Final Four with a bad team. There's no such thing. I think really only 2015 was the singular year that you looked at and went, how in the world did that team make it to the Final Four? This, if they make it to the second weekend or even the third weekend, this will have to go down as Izzo's best coaching job. Because once again, there was that period, and it happens all the time. It happens every year. It happens to the best Izzo teams that you look at, and you're like, I don't see them getting past the first weekend, and then they just find it in March. I don't think there's enough depth. I don't think there's enough defensively for this team to make a long run. But, you know, I'm, I'm never counting Izzo out of anything. And ultimately, they're, they, they're going to have a shot in the second round pending something crazy, to end Coach K's coaching career. Literally end his career. The next game Coach K loses, uh, or or if he wins a national championship, he's done. He has been on record saying he's done. Now, if there's a coach in America who's m- enough of an egomaniac to come out of retirement after after a year-long farewell tour, uh, it would be him. But I think, I, think he's, I think he's done. That would be an interesting, interesting proposition, right? I mean, Michigan State and Duke... Uh, Duke has been a thorn in Izzo's side for so long, though Izzo does have some some big wins against him, 05 in the Sweet 16 and obviously 2019 in the Elite Eight. But you now Izzo's a humble guy, and he will never admit to this, but I don't think there's anything in the world that would please him more than knocking uh, Mike Krzyzewski off uh, permanently in the second round. But they got to get by Davidson first. I think they've taken substantial steps forward. It's a good team. I think that they fall somewhere in between where they played or how they played in February, early March, to where they were when they were 14-2 and two ranked in the top 10 in the country. It's a good team and, a, and an excellent program. They'll be all right. I just don't know if they'll be all right this year. Moving on, we're going to talk a little baseball news. The Tigers are in Lakeland for spring training. What uh, what an insane story this became. I, the labor negotiations, for the most part, just annoyed me. Like None of that stuff really... It never fascinated me. The term CBT, collective bargaining tax, arbitration. When I watch a game, I don't think about that shit. That's for nerds to figure out. And, you know, pot, meat, kettle. I'm the biggest nerd that anyone's ever going to be. But at the same, like, I don't, that stuff doesn't fascinate me. It doesn't really interest me. I said that from the beginning. Everyone's, are you pro player or are you pro owner? I'm pro whatever the hell is going to get us a Major League Baseball season. And these two sides stumbled and bumbled and fumbled for months. I said in the video that I made, after it was announced that we're going to be playing a full season, I said, hey, man, this is great, but I'm not viewing this 
as some overwhelming success for either side. What's that line from Attack of the Clones? Victory, no victory. The Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen, begun the Clone War has. Like, it, there's there's no victory here for either side. They took a 42-day vacation and then had a staring contest for two months until finally they broke down. And one day I feel like we're going to get a documentary about this where we're going to find out that at some point someone said something where they just said, damn it, make a deal or we're done. We're done. We have to get this done. And they did. Who's that character? There's a character in the comics... And she was in Deadpool 2 as well, which is Domino, who her superpower is that she's lucky. And she goes through all these events where cars just almost hit her, but just miss her. Planes will crash and she'll like fall out. Like she's always, she's the luckiest hero alive. That's this version of Major League Baseball. These labor negotiations were the domino of baseball history where none of this should have worked out. It was a complete mess. By, from what I heard, and not just what I heard, what was reported, as of two days before last Thursday, so last Tuesday, I don't know why I, I, don't know why I put it that way, two days before the day after tomorrow, uh, I, I, it seemed like they weren't even really that close. And they found their way. Against all odds, not only are they going to play a full season, which is huge, I think this not only works out better for Major League Baseball, but I'll explain why I think it works better for the Tigers. As far as Major League Baseball goes, and, and my favorite radio show in the world, my favorite sports show to listen to is the Michael K Show in New York. I think those guys are brilliant. Michael K is the uh, radio, or I'm sorry, the, oh my God, radio. The TV voice for the New York Yankees. His co-host is Don LaGreca, who I believe, who I think is just brilliant. And they have Peter Rosenberg there as well as the, as the third chair. Uh, but Don brought up the fact that opening day should be on April 7th. You shouldn't be playing baseball on March 31st. They played it last year. They were, there was snowing. It was a cool moment, but it was 25 degrees. Miggy hit a, a opposite field home run against the uh, name name redacted here. They're now the Guardians uh, in the snow. Like, you know, at least it'll be a little bit warmer. You would think it is Michigan for God's sakes by April 7th or technically April 8th. The Tigers open against the White Sox. But as far as the Tigers are concerned, my no, the number one thing I want out of this season. Do I want him to make the playoffs? Of course. I want him to win the World Series. Like, I, I feel that way almost every year. But what I truly hope is that we're in July or early August and this team is playing a relatively meaningful baseball, especially with the expanded postseason. I want a team that's within three to five games of a wild card spot into the second half of the season. I would view that as a, as a success. Even if they fall apart, I view it as a success. But what had me worried, and I didn't say it publicly because I didn't want to pee in anyone's cornflakes, but they didn't have a particularly favorable schedule to open the season. And there's nothing worse than that. It's the old adage, and it's overused, but man, I'll be damned if it's not true. You can't win the pennant in April, but you can sure as hell lose it. That is that is the case. And when I looked at this team's schedule prior to the, to, to the lockout, prior to the labor negotiations, they opened against Seattle, who was a 90-plus win team last year, who's going to be starting a Cy Young winner on opening day, pending an injury in Robbie Ray, who they just signed. Had a tremendous bullpen a year ago. Pretty darn good manager in Scott Service, a team that's hungry. They haven't made the playoffs in forever. And then you go to Oakland in your next series, and Oakland, I think, is not very good, but on, except for the postseason, for whatever reason, the Tigers don't play well in Oakland, and they never really have, and the West Coast trips are brutal. And then you open with, a I believe, a three-game set at home against the defending AL Central champions in Chicago. My biggest fear was that this is a team that starts the season, you know, ten and twenty, and people lose interest. That would have been that would have been worst case scenario. You want you would much rather have a team that collapses late than collapses early. And I know some people are going to fight back against that, but you are so wrong. You are so wrong with that assessment. I know last year's Padres had a historically bad second half, but at least they were competitive, like relatively late into the season. There's nothing worse than looking at the standings in mid-May and seeing a team that's out of it. Now, last year, this team was 6-24. and They ended up playing, I believe, at an 86-win pace, 85-win pace. The last four months of the season ended up scratching out 77 wins. Pretty neat accomplishment, but that team did not have the expectations that this Tigers team is going to have. And because of that, the last thing I would want is to see this team get off to a pitiful start. And the reason that bringing it all back around, uh, those first six, seven games are now rescheduled. The Tigers will open at home against the Chicago White Sox. Hey, no slouch. Again, the White Sox are 
really, really good and far and away the most talented team in the division. I, I expect they will run away with the division this year. But I would much rather open at home against Comerica and with a few home series than go on the West Coast, man. And, and yeah, I know last year, I feel like I'm leaving out the elephant in the room. I know last year um, the Tigers swept the Mariners in Seattle, including Spencer Turnbull's no-hitter, which changed my life. The 0-2. Swing and a miss! They struck him out! No hitter, Spencer Turnbull! A good thing happened. Exception, not the rule. Playing games at 10 o'clock uh, on the East Coast against teams from the West Coast I traditionally has not gone very well for the Tigers. I want this team to get off to a reasonable start so we can be looking at the standings in May, in June, and July and saying, hey man, we're still in it. Now the last little thing I'll talk about is the fact that free agency is now open. Spring training is now underway. So great, man. I, I One thing I missed more than anything, I missed listening to A.J. Hinch talk. It's my joy. I watched every one of his post conferences last year and then went back and watched him again and wrote a blog about it. But Moving on beyond that, free agency is now open, and there's a lot of people who are wondering what the move is that the Tigers are going to make. Now, yesterday, Sonny Gray, who has had a very good career, I mean, not like a lead, not a Hall of Fame, but he's made a few All-Star teams and had some very good years with the Reds, just got traded to the Minnesota Twins. The Twins had a really bad rotation last year. You add Gray, who wasn't amazing. I think he had a 4-1-9-something uh, ERA uh, for the, uh, the Red Legs. A season ago, but a good pitcher. He'll pitch well on that park, I believe. You know, he's got got solid stuff. Has he's had great stuff ever since he went to Bandy. And you look at a team like the Tigers, and it's just like you know, it's the it's that gif of the guy poking somebody with a stick, just to saying, "Come on, do something." Like, hey, buy a signing. You got your shortstop. Was it the best shortstop on the market? No. Was it the second or third best? No. Was it the fourth or fifth? I I don't know. I don't know if he's better than Story. And then you got Eduardo Rodriguez. All right, cool. You traded for Tucker Barnhart. All right. So the team is better. But, man, you got to make one or two more moves. You got to make one or two more moves. And you got to get a starter. Now, one thing the Tigers, at some point soon, I don't think it'll happen this uh, offseason. Maybe at the deadline. Maybe next offseason. But Al Avila is so adamantly against trading prospects. I think that's a little bit short-sighted. I don't want to trade Spencer Torkelson. I don't want to trade Riley Green, but I do think that this farm system has enough prospects, especially when you look at what the the Twins traded uh, to Cincinnati to get Sonny Gray. Like, there's enough there's enough solid prospects in the system where you could make a huge move and get a Luis Castillo, who also pitches for the Reds, who I love, and I, it appears the Reds are almost in fire sale mode. At this point, they never really had much of a championship window to begin with, but whatever window they had uh, seems to have closed. I think they're going to bank on a, a Joey Votto retirement tour here in a few years and then you know, probably start to get competitive competitive again, uh, hopefully. like I, I think that you're, you're limiting yourself when you refuse to trade prospects. Obviously, yes, you did trade for Tucker Barnhart, but you traded Tucker Barnhart for you know, a bucket of balls. I, you, for who was it? It was Ken, uh, Nick Quintana who was the third baseman out of Arizona that they drafted in the second round, I believe, in 2019. But if you're not going to trade prospects, all right, fine. You got to make another move. A lot of people are clamoring for another reliever, and I, I wouldn't turn it down. I worry that they would sign someone who stinks because relievers are fragile. This is a hill I'm going to die on, and I could end up looking really stupid. I think the Tigers' bullpen is going to be good this year. I think they have good pitchers. When you look at between Soto, Cisnero, Falmer, Funkhauser, potentially Tyler Alexander, Alex Lang, I think I'm leaving somebody out. I uh, I think I'm not saying every one of those guys is going to be lights out, but I think that that's it's a pretty good setup there. Those are guys who pitched not just good, but at points really like great baseball last year. The one big move they need to make is uh, they got to get another starting pitcher. And I know AJ was uh, on record yesterday saying that as of now he has full confidence Tyler Alexander can be a fifth starter. And you know what? Maybe he could. Alexander was a very pleasant surprise down the stretch last season. But as a long reliever, that's a really neat idea. You got to get one more, though. I, I really think that when we, as fans, and I'm not going to stomp my feet and say you owe us this, but as fans who've had to put up with this arduous rebuild for so long, to come out of this offseason and say, hey, we just got Barnhart, Baez, and Rodriguez, is, might be a little bit, that's a bit of a tough sell. I, I stand by my belief 
and it's a belief I've maintained since the bias signing, even before the bias signing. I believe the Tigers will be a good team in 2022. Now, that is such a broad statement, right? Define good. Good can be 82 and 80, and good can be 162. I don't know. I think it's high ceiling, low floor, but the expectation should be fight for a wild card spot. Given the roster they have right now, pending health and pending what the rookies do, and that's going to be that's going to be the kicker. If Green and Torkelson turn out to be those dudes right away, then yeah, we are we are talking about like a 2015 Cubs type of turnaround, a team that goes from 70 something wins to 90 right away off the backs of their young players. Um, the difference is that was you know a, a team owned by the Ricketts and Theo Epstein was that team's GM, and they spent a gobs of money after 2014. The Tigers have not spent gobs. It may be a singular gob. It's a gob of money, but not multiple gobs. All right. Episode one in the books, man. Look, I, I'm going to need your feedback. I don't know uh, what you all think about this. And this thing, like I said, it's going to grow. It's going to change. But um, I, I needed to get some stuff off my chest and talk. And we did today. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow me on Twitter at Castellani2014. The link to my Twitter is in the the description of this video we will be back here on friday recapping some ncaa tournament games and potentially talking about some baseball news thank you so much for watching everybody i'll be right back here by the end of this week have a good one peace and happiness